with me. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to be here because I know I'm probably in the minority in that I am representing a federal agency, and I think I'm speaking to almost all private sector. Or by raise of hands, how many federal folks are here? Oh, more than I thought. Excellent. Welcome. Uh, I want to talk to you today about a concept that no doubt everybody in this room has heard about, but I would argue is probably the most misunderstood concept and the concept that is all too often relegated back to that that we always knew to be diversity in EEO. And, and what I want to talk to you about is inclusion. And the reason I want to talk to you about inclusion today is because I will guarantee you that there is no other concept that will be more influential on the business outcomes of your organizations than the concept of inclusion. And before we can talk about how that happens, you need to understand why and how that is different from diversity. So let's, let's start with some context. And by the way, forgive me, you know, Frank told me, can't you jazz up your slides a little bit, Georgia? They look a little bureaucratic. Actually, I can't. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just simply a fact. I simply can't. So here we go. Um, here's some facts here, folks. You all have heard the date 2042. Some people, sometimes uh, 2043 creeps up. That is the date that the Census Bureau projects that we will no longer be a majority-dominated uh, American society in terms of race, gender, ethnicity. There will no longer be a majority demographic. We will truly be a nation of diversity. And yes, now I am talking about uh, diversity in the traditional sense, race, gender, ethnicity, age, and so forth. Uh, you also know that a new entrance to your labor market, to all of our labor market, is going to be uh, people from other countries, people of color, uh, foreign-born individuals. Let's throw in millennials in that, too, because they're a different population that are going to make different demands on the organization as well. Disabilities affect one in five of uh, Americans. We're going to be seeing that become more and more of an issue in the workplace. We now know that women hold a very different place in the food chain, right? In the last few years, we've seen women now dominate the majority of college degrees and graduate degrees. So it's going to take some time before the corporate sector catches up, but it will have to. It will have to. We still know that, uh, that women CEOs are by far the minority in Fortune 500 uh, companies and still, by the way, the minority in senior executive service positions in, uh, in my sector, in the public sector. But that is going to have to change as the demographics change. Uh, LGBT, huge issue, and I'm, I'm proud to say that my agency, VA, Department of Veterans Affairs, which many of you may uh, think of as sort of a conservative organization because we deal with, uh, you know, former active duty military, let me tell you, we're stepping out into the front to recognize the needs and the contributions and the importance of this aspect of our diversity to make sure that we're serving not only our LGBT veterans, but have them in our workforce so they can give culturally competent care. Um, I'll let you read the rest of them. The reason I, set, I start this out is because I want to remind everyone that our demographic landscape is changing, and that means that your demographic landscape is changing. And make no mistake, unless our organizational cultures catch up with this reality, our organizations are doomed to fail. And that is sort of an extreme concept, isn't it? It's an extreme statement. But we can only go so long by maintaining these rigid organizational cultures that were created during a period of time where you had a single demographic majority kind of running the show and a single mindset, which is even more dangerous, uh, operating in the organization. We have to change the way we think about work and the way we think about our human resources. Okay, very quickly, the challenge. Diversity and inclusion must be the cornerstones of all of our talent management strategy. And I loved hearing my colleagues talk about talent management and engagement. This, it was a perfect sort of um, uh, background for what I want to talk about today. Talent management absolutely is going to be the key. That's the answer. That's going to be the solution. It's not going to be technology. Technology is a given. Let me quickly add that. We know how much technology has changed the way we do business and how we succeed at our business. But that's not going to be the game changer. The game changer is going to be our talent management strategy. And we have to understand that diversity alone is not enough. And I'll explain that in a minute. You have to couple it with deliberate, intentional inclusion strategies. Core understanding, EEO 
for those of you in my, in my, my federal uh, peers, you know that EEO refers to the laws, regulations, policies that guarantee all of our rights to equal employment opportunity. Uh, I think everybody in the room understands that. I think most of us also understand that diversity, and I'm using a quote uh, from Roosevelt Thomas, who sadly passed away last year. He wrote Beyond Race and Gender. He was the first to start defining diversity truly beyond race and gender, but know that it includes race, gender, ethnicity, disability status, but also all the ways in which we are similar and different. I would suggest to you that when we talk about diversity today, we are still talking about outreach. We are still talking about targeted recruitment and outreach and reaching out to those underrepresented uh, populations. And we do that for good reason. We do it partially for legal reasons. We all know there's a legal imperative. We do it, I hope, for ethical reasons. We think it's a matter of fairness, a fairness of opportunity. But now we're going to start hearing more and more, and he actually started that dialogue, why it's a business imperative. Now let's go to inclusion. That's the latest iteration, and that's the paradigm shift that I want to encourage you to talk to your leadership about, because it's going to have to start with your leadership. And those of you who are in the HR community, which I suspect are the majority, you are the facilitators. You're the change agents for your leadership to change the, the paradigm of your organizations, to change your organizational culture to being one of inclusion. And inclusion is simply this. It is taking that diversity that I know you already have, for the most part, for the most part, you already have, and leveraging it in our workforce to, to uh, encourage and achieve optimum participation. Think of inclusion as the verb, the action word, where diversity is the noun. If you've got a diverse workforce, and I'm seeing great diversity in this room, it is not enough if what I do as your leader is suppressing you to think act, work, contribute the same way we've done it for the last 30 or 40 years. What good is all this great diversity if I am force-fitting you as your manager into the same old way of, in which we've done things? That is the inclusion paradigm. We're going to talk about some very specific strategies in a moment, but keep that in the back of your mind. You're going to hear how leadership development and mentoring and coaching all factor into this. I think we already defined this. But no, the second bullet is very, very important. This is not going to happen automatically. This is not going to be a natural evolution in your organizational culture. This requires intentionality. You are going to have to step out of your own comfort zones. And I guarantee you, every one of us have it. Sometimes people call it unconscious bias. Sometimes people call it just sort of rote behavior. But whatever it is, you're going to have to intentionally, deliberately Change the way you do business. Change the way you manage. Change the way you set up work teams. Change the way you establish business processes in order to ensure that you have full inclusion. But I guarantee you the benefits will be worth it. OK. Uh, research. You already know. I, I, again, you know, forgive me. I just want you to have it for your background. There are ample empirical studies that have already shown this should no longer be a debate that workforce diversity in its traditional sense now, race, gender, ethnicity, disability, and so forth, age, LGBT, uh, workforce diversity is associated with higher business performance outcomes. There will be those sort of academic naysayers who say, actually, that's not true, Georgia. We found that the more diverse a workforce, the greater conflict there is, the greater um, productivity imp um, impediments there are when everybody's not on the same page. Think about those words. Well, first of all, let me say that person is right. Diversity without inclusion strategies will not work. It will not yield those higher performance outcomes. That's why it's important that you need to understand the inclusion piece of this. But overall workforce diversity, when leveraged with inclusion practices, is going to increase your performance outcomes. And multiple studies show this. All right. One thing I want you to leave with today, I want you to understand that this is not just the responsibility of your HR or EEO or diversity offices. Please don't relegate everything that we're talking about here today to, OK, well, that's HR or that's EEO. That's their problem. I got to you know, I, I gotta get reports out. I got to fix uh, computers. I've got to you know, produce widgets. Know that you're not going to get your reports out fix widgets, you know, uh, do whatever your mission is. 
to the best that you can do it unless you incorporate these inclusion strategies. HR cannot be the only one that is incorporating these strategies. In fact, in many ways, they're the least, and I'll tell you why. It's that frontline supervisor who's in every corner of your organization. He or she is the one that's going to have to implement these strategies. Now, where you come in as HR is you're going to help them. You're going to teach them. You're going to start ushering in this new cultural change. But please don't want let anyone tell you, I can't worry about this. It's an HR strategy or it's an EEO strategy. And we will tell you some accountability measures that we've done at VA to help this happen. Okay, I am going to talk about government, but I suspect that many of the private sector uh, organizations in this room may recognize themselves in the models that I'm about to show you. Uh, here's the, here's the, the traditional current state of government. Doesn't matter what agency. I don't care what agency it is. Yes, some agencies are going to be more sort of cutting edge and leading edge, and some are going to be behind. But by and large, the current state of government looks like this. It's a bureaucratic bureaucratic model. And the term bureaucratic, although it's you know, adopted, it's, it's become uh, a pejorative term. It's actually the name of the model. I mean, that's exactly, if you look it up in the, in the books, that was what government was intended to be structured as, a bureaucratic model, characterized by hierarchies, chains of command, controlled communications. And again, I ask you to look at your own organizations. Linear business processes, because we all thought the fastest way and the best way to get from point A to point B is a straight line. Well, not necessarily, and we'll talk about that. Um, Self-reinforcing maintenance of the status quo. Now, that is sort of an editorial comment by me, but let me add that I would suggest that everything you're going to see about the current state of most federal agencies has these practices embedded in them. And what I mean by that is we have systems we have reward systems. We have incentive systems that are predicated on you doing things the way you've always done them. Very few of our reward systems are going to reward, in a meaningful way, people to go outside the line, to color outside the lines, to go outside their box. Now, there's reasons for this. You know, Believe me, your organizations don't do this just to be mean. They do it because they think it's efficient. And they think it's the way to get from point A to point B. But I'm going to ask you to think differently. And then finally, government, and I'll bet many of your organizations to operate on what is known as a heroic uh, leadership model, meaning there is one guy or woman, probably guy, at the top that is the hero. He's the guy that calls all the shots. He's the ultimate power uh, broker. He's the major influence of your organization. And everything cascades down below that. And yes, the power you know, sort of cascades as well. But it all comes up to that pinpoint. And here's what that looks like. And I just thought it was kind of cool. You know, everybody who ever took Psych 101 knows about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, we're at the bottom of the pyramid. We take care of our food and safety and so forth. And then the higher up the social pyramid we go, we have belongingness, self-esteem, and finally self-actualization. Well, I just thought it was an interesting analogy to how our leadership models are. The employees are at the bottom. All they care about is that paycheck. I need that paycheck. I got to pay my rent. And as we go up, you see a little more power and influence to finally the leadership. Here's where we need to be, and here's where all of us need to be, private and public sector alike. We need to flatten these organizations. Yes, there's going to be some pain associated with that. It's not always uh, what you would consider conventionally the most efficient way, but I, I'm going to share with you why it's important. We need to empower our contributors. That's the key of everything. You've heard the word engagement uh, talked about. That's not just a buzzword. Uh, I, I, it's easy for us to sort of be cynical like that. It's the latest buzzword of the day, employee engagement. But everything is pointing to, unless we have that employee engagement, which is very closely aligned to full inclusion, we are not going to get organizational performance. And again, we're not going to keep up with the demands uh, of our customers. Um, the rest of those, I'll, I'll just let you read for yourself. The key here is we want to encourage dissent. I'll go so far as to say we need dissent. We put there divergent thinking because I want you to think about your business processes. And this goes to HR and your leadership telling those first-line supervisors to rethink their business processes, to get away from that linear model that converges to almost a preordained outcome. You already know what the answer is. You already know what the solution or the product is, what it should look like. We're asking you to rethink that. We're asking you to get different 
divergent views, and yes, that means being tolerant and embracing of dissent. Don't fear dissent. And this is what it should look like when you flip that pyramid. What it should look like is now the largest part of the base is at the top, and that's your employees. Now, does that mean they call all the shots? No. As you'll see, that middle bar, power and influence, has a, has a double-edged uh, arrow, has a two-directional, two bi-directional arrow. The power and influence is shared. The self-actualization has to begin with employees. Read that as inclusion. Read that as engagement. Because until they own their jobs and feel like they have some sense of purpose, mastery, contribution, and influence, they're not going to help advance the mission. And your leaders alone can't do it. What are leaders without followers? You need your employees to feel that sense of self-actualization. So this is the flipped pyramid that, that I want you to take visually back to your organizations. All right, how do we get there? Real quickly, uh, starts with leadership. And leadership is at all levels, including, don't forget that first line supervisor, uh, that is the most overlooked individual in your organization and arguably the most powerful and influential in, because he touches all of your employees. So first of all, leaders from at all levels, recognize that you do have unconscious bias. We all have it. And I put up the Harvard Implicit Association test, if those of you who are familiar with it, uh, it there's a website, you just, you know, I think you can just Google the, those words. It will test your own unconscious bias, and you'll be surprised at yourself. All of us have it. We make immediate, fast brain connections about people and about their value, their relative value. Be very careful of that, because we are using our own filters to not only limit opportunity for people, which is, it, which is the most detrimental, but we're also limiting our organizational performance by thinking in a very narrow way. Um, open your mindset. Powered accountability must flow down. You have to flip that pyramid. And of course, employees bear a responsibility too. They have to develop their own cultural competency. They have to connect those with those different. Nothing drives me crazier. I know you've all seen it in high schools and middle schools, but you see it in your cafeterias too sometimes where people of you know, like uh, appearances group together at the lunch table. Now, maybe not so much in the adult world, but it does still happen. That's a simple but, but very obvious apparent way to show you that we need to break down some silos. We need to think differently about how we relate and work to each other. Business process reengineering. I said to you that this was not going to be um, strictly an HR strategy. So this is where HR will come in, but it certainly doesn't end there. HR just tees it up, and your diversity office and your leadership just tees it up. But every organizational unit in your organization has to rethink its business processes. Whatever your line of business is, whether you're making widgets or drafting policy, you have got to design your processes so that it invites optimum input. You can manage this so that it's not burdensome and inefficient and overwhelming. But right now, I guarantee your processes are, are built in such a way, designed in such a way, not to include and encourage uh, optimum contribution, but in fact to discourage it. Because again, you're, you're trying to get from the, the, the fastest way from point A to point B. And there are examples of this in different uh, organizations. But I'll, to use my own organization, and we do draft policy as well as do training and uh, all sorts of other programs, we have teams. We have functionally aligned teams in my office. And each of those teams is generally aligned with one of the strategic goals, not only of my office, but of VA with respect to diversity and inclusion. So there is that sort of linear alignment. But make no mistake, my office knows that we will never operate in those silos. In fact, a product is not com considered complete. There's, there's, it's not considered vetted from a quality assurance standpoint unless I am convinced, and they can show all of us, not just me, but each other, that there has been input from all of our teams as well as our stakeholders. So again, use interdisciplinary teams, encourage divergent thought, deconstruct those silos, and the easiest way to do this is by communicating. Even if you don't want to reorganize your offices and your, and your, office, your, your uh, other organizations don't want to restructure, at least communicate as much as possible. I dare say nobody in this room operates under a top secret, well, maybe some of you do, <laughs> classification. 
But I always say, look, we're not the CIA. We do not need to, to close hold all of our information just to those, that small cadre of leaders on a need-to-know basis. Quite honestly, I think that's insulting. I think it's diminishing of our employees, and it's not doing us as leaders any good in terms of getting the best outcomes. Open up your communication streams. There's less to risk than you think. Um, and continuous learning. I heard one of my peers talk about that. Very important. Uh, there's a study that was done that, that showed, I think Dan Pink did the study, that employees no longer are motivated, maybe you know this, it's hard to see sometimes, but this is what he's found, are no longer motivated by money. That is, that is like fourth or fifth down the road in terms of priority. The top uh, couple that I could recall are mastery and sense of purpose, and education, that was the third. Mastery, sense of purpose, and continuous learning. That's what motivates employees. And, and think about it. I'll bet, because I know anecdotally, I am knowing more and more people who are leaving jobs to take pay cuts because they want that sense of mastery and purpose. And particularly, you're going to see this with our millennials. I'm not going to limit it to them, but you're going to see it very much so in, the, in our millennials. OK, finally, the last concept I want to share with you, I think I'm OK on time, uh, are very important uh, piece of this is how do we measure this. Once we understand what the concept of inclusion is and how it relates to engagement and how it relates further to higher organizational performance, uh, we need to know how do we measure this. We have to have a baseline and we have to know whether we're going in the right direction or not. Plenty of strategies to implement, but we need, unless we have a, a benchmark, a, a ruler to know if it's a su successful, we could be spinning in circles. So we at VA, and I don't know that this is going to be necessarily applicable to many of you, but I, I'm happy to share it with you, have developed what we call our diversity index. Now, federal uh, colleagues, you know that we in the federal government have to produce an MD-715 report, which is this voluminous report with, replete with 42 statistical tables that, frankly, nobody reads. Uh, they read the strategies, but they don't go through. I don't even go through all the tables. It's you know, literally sometimes hundreds of pages of numbers that talk about the breakdown of your workforce by race, gender, ethnicity at different occupational levels leadership levels, you name it, different organizations. And that's necessary. I'm not diminishing it. It's necessary, but it's not very efficient to drive change. We found a way to come up with a single diversity metric that at a glance could show our leadership, are we going in the right or the wrong direction? Because our leadership is now sold on this business case for diversity and inclusion. Now they want to know, OK, what are we doing about it? Are we getting there? So we've come up with this diversity index. Uh, the, the graph simply shows that typically in government, and maybe in your organizations as well, we, we measure diversity by the relative uh, representation of our incumbent workforce, let's say African-American females. And what is that ratio between the African-American females in our organization to African-American fe females in the civilian labor force? And then we can further drill it down to in the relevant civilian labor force, comparing attorneys to attorneys, that sort of thing. Well, we've taken all that. We're, we're, we're abiding by that rule. But now we've, we've come up with an algorithm that brings, you, brings all that down to one single number. So what you have is you, you can see a line graph like that. Those are our uh, one, two, three. There should be four lines there, four organizations within VA. And those numbers at the bottom ranging from 74 in 2002 to what is it, 86 in 2012 for VA-wide, with that one single number, you can see slowly but surely we're going in the right direction. Now, that's a compelling metric for a, for a leader who doesn't want to have the time or inclination to read 42 tables of statistics. OK. Uh, we also have an inclusion index, and I'm going to end uh, with this and a couple of strategies. Um, the diversity index shows just that, diversity of your workforce by race, gender, ethnicity. You have to start with that. You cannot ignore that. That is absolutely a, a, a predicate for everything else we talk about. But once you've done that, now we need to know how included do your employees feel. And the best metric we could com come up with was survey metrics. Uh, there's a number of different ways you can measure inclusion, but we found that the, the most valid way based on research as well as our own experiences is by surveying our workforce. In the government, we have the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. You, no doubt, have climate surveys in your organizations. You can adapt the same model. 
we went through a year-long process in my office, in, in uh, collaboration with OPM, I might add, Office of Personnel Management, to identify 20 validated items in the federal employee viewpoint that are related to inclusion in the workplace. And that, too, we came up with a single score that represents how employees feel about those six dimensions of inclusion that, again, the research told us were important. Um, these are some of the sample items. And, and, and again, you could look at your own surveys and, and come up with uh, analogous ones. But these are some of the sample items. I feel encouraged to come up with new and better ways of doing things. That represents participation in decision making. That's one of the survey items that we were measuring to see how, how included people feel. Um, and that comes up, as I said, with a one single number that we can track. The idea, by the way, just to close that point, we're going to take our diversity index, our inclusion index over the last 10 years, and now we're going to map it to performance. And now we're going to put our money where our mouth is. We're going to say, we've been telling you, and the research has been telling you, that D&I are positively correlated with organizational performance. Now we're going to test that hypothesis and give you VA data on that. Um, so. In closing, what are some of the strategies? I mentioned it. Very, very easy stuff. Some of it. Some of it's very easy. Communications, I think, is very easy. If we are making it complicated, you need to question that. There is nothing complicated about op open communication. Uh, and there is less to risk than you think. In-reach. All this is really about in-reach. I haven't used that term too much. But that's the paradigm shift from, from EEO diversity to inclusion. We need to now, now that we've done a reasonably good job at outreach, reasonably, we now need to inreach. We now need to take that great diversity in our midst and make sure it goes up throughout the organization at all leadership levels. Uh, continuous learning, leadership development should be up there, it is. Uh, business process reengineering, and then f last but not least, uh, leadership accountability and metrics. I did mention uh, one way to get traction on any of this is put it in your leader's performance plans. Make it a critical performance element, public and private sector alike. Make it critical for them to show measurable progress on some of these metrics. Um, I'm out of time, but I will say the, the last thing I will talk about is if we don't do this, there is more to lose than just lawsuits, employees through attrition, um, or even business um, results. There's more to lose than that. And here are some very tragic examples. In each of these different communities, the after action reviews that were done to isolate what some of the factors were that led to the failures in each of these areas, starting with the intelligence community, the post 9-11 after action review, the uh, WMD report, showed that some of the factors, some of the key factors that led to those failures were things like hardened attitudes against change, insular organizations, insistence on preserving the status quo, there is probably no more powerful organizational cultural influence than that last bullet. We all have to have these self-reinforcing mechanisms that make us want to keep to the stat status quo, partly because we're fearful of going outside of it. That has got to change. Scientific community, the Columbia and, I will add, the Challenger disasters, both had factors uh, associated with them, such as organizational cultures that squelch dissent. Emails were received that warned about certain possibilities that were, that were ignored. That's an inclusion factor. That's an inclusion barrier. That's not just you know, a process or an SOP. That's an inclusion challenge. Um, party line vision that led to flawed decision making, self-deception. Economic uh, community, the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy, which led to the Great Recession, ultimately. Insular organizations were identified as factors that led to that. Narrow decision making, and I would add limited communications, outmoded embedded cultural habits, and inflexible structures. Those are the things that, that we need to pay attention to in every one of our organizations. Otherwise, we are at risk of repeating some of the failures that we've had in the past. So I want to leave you with the very positive outcomes that we started out with as to why diversity and inclusion can truly be a game changer for your organizations, but we can't forget some of the potential risks if we don't. So here are the ta uh, takeaways. This is more than a legal imperative. Yes, it's a legal imperative, but so much more. It's business imperative in this century. It, go it begins with our fundamental 
guarantee of civil rights. And that should be a given. I shouldn't have to convince you of that. That should be a given. It begins there. It just doesn't end there. Inclusion is leveraging and diversity, and exclusion breeds costly results. Know that, uh, boy, those arrows are kind of out of place, aren't they? But what I meant to say at the bottom there is that inclusion yields engagement, which yields higher performance. So flip the pyramid. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you for your attention, and good luck in your uh, endeavors.